Vivian and singers and Josh. Keep playing, keep playing, keep playing. It's the first time I've heard that song. It's a beautiful song. Let it rain. Just let it rain. Yes, yeah, Pastor JB just reminded us a moment ago, what is this, two weeks and then it's, it's all over. It's not too late for him to rain down on us. Let that love rain down. It's not too late. We need it. I want to pray with you. Think out loud with you, with Jesus. Lord Jesus, how could it be too late? Yes, you're coming soon. Yes, this world desperately needs you. But we're saying, let it rain now. Not for our warm fuzzies, but let it rain now for the depth of what you want to do in my heart, what you want to do in all of our hearts. Rain down on us right now through your mighty spirit. We pray in a name that is above every name. Amen. Here's a letter. I'd like to read it to you. I got it just a few days ago. Dear Pastor, the Bible says things against being LGBTQ+. Since I am bisexual, does that mean I won't go to heaven? I don't want to put anything before the Trinity, but I also don't want to give up my feelings. Could you do a sermon on God and the LGBTQ plus community? It would help a lot. Thank you very much. God bless. Happy Sabbath. And the person signs the note. P.S. Please forgive any grammar, spelling, or punctuation mistakes. I'm only 11. Wow. I'm only 11. I want to say to this 11-year-old two things. Number one, the maker of all things loves and wants you. Amen. How can I be so sure? Because the maker of all things loves and wants me. And if he can love and want the likes of me, and there's no reason why he doesn't love and want you, bisexual or not. And number two, you wanted a sermon on LGBTQ+. Plus? Well, by God's grace, here it comes. <laughs> Let's think out loud together, you and me. You're 11. I'm just a little bit older than that. And we can talk and understand each other. So since, since this is a series on marriage, it makes sense to talk about same gender or same sex marriage, doesn't it? Why not? It's still a bit controversial. The United States Supreme Court's ruling named Obergefell v. Hodges came out in the summer of 2015. I suppose pretty much everybody knows about this landmark civil rights case that declared that the fundamental right to marry is guaranteed to same-sex couples by the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution, end quote. It was a five to four ruling, but that ruling requires every one of the 50 states and the District of Columbia and what they call the insular areas, that would be like Puerto Rico and Guam, there are 13 of them on this planet, to perform and recognize the marriages of same-sex couples on the same terms and conditions as the marriages of opposite-sex couples with all the accompanying rights and responsibilities. Justice Anthony Kennedy, who is no longer on the court, wrote the majority opinion, and he concludes it with these words. So you're going to read a little bit of the Supreme Court's rendering 
on the screen right here. No union is more profound than marriage, for it embodies the highest ideas of love, fidelity, devotion, sacrifice, and family. In in forming a marital union, two people become something greater than once they were. As some of the petitioners in these cases demonstrate, marriage embodies a love that may endure even past death. It would misunderstand these men and women to say that they disrespect the idea of marriage. Their plea is that they do respect it, respect it so deeply that they seek to find its fulfillment for themselves. Their hope is not to be condemned to live in loneliness, excluded from one of civilization's oldest institutions. They ask for equal dignity in the eyes of the law. The Constitution grants them that right. End quote. So are same-sex, same-gender marriages, are they legal? Are they valid? Like the sociologist Mark, Mark McNairis writes, legality is validity in civil marriage, but not necessarily in religious marriage. Hence the debate, the discussion. And just two months ago, the Pope himself decided to wade into all of this as he issued a paper. This is not an encyclical. This is a paper that responds to questions about the church and the blessing of same-sex marriages. All right? So let's, let's look at his words. For this reason, it is not licit. That means it is not legal in Roman Catholic churches now. That's what he's talking about. To impart a blessing on relationships or partnerships, even though they may be stable. That's what he means there. That involves sexual activity outside of marriage. In other words, outside the indissoluble union of a man and a woman, open in itself to the transmission of life. It's a union that can go on producing new human beings and new human beings and so on. That's what he's saying. As is the case of the unions between persons of the same sex. It's a little chopped up there, the English translation. But his point is clear, not in the church. We got it. Yeah, but what does the Bible say? I had a co-ed from this campus drop by for a visit here at the church the other day. She brought her Bible with, with her. She's been listening very carefully to this marriage series, and she knew that this Sabbath we would be focusing on same sex or same gender marriage. I had a, I must tell you, a valuable conversation with her for an hour. Most of us are pretty clear on this definition of marriage. I mean, it it seems to make sense to us. You have have two records. You have the creation story in Genesis. You have the gospel story of the incarnation. And between those two, it isn't rocket science for us to say, God, what would you say a definition of marriage is? We know it. But one more time, come on. Let's just do it. Let's go back to the back to the beginning, the very first page of your Bible, Genesis chapter 1. We'll go to Genesis 1. We reread the words. Genesis chapter 1. Sixth day of creation. Drop down to verse 27. We've already asserted in this journey of this new year together. One, one incontrovertible truth. In fact, I would suggest to you that you can take all universal truth and reduce it to this single line, the maker of all things loves and wants me. That's why we've been coming back to it again and again. Now, it's obvious that we're going to see that right here. He loves and wants us. Genesis 1, So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Which, by the way, does not mean that everybody today has to get married in order to be happy. That's not what he's saying. 
It does not mean that everybody today has to have kids to be happy. But you understand that if there is no marriage between Adam and Eve, there would be no human race, right? So after he creates them, he says, now, be fruitful and multiply. I'm going to make you little creators. I'm the big creator. I understand that. But you become little creators. You do something called procreation. You share like I did. You're going to make somebody in your own image, little tiny yous running around, deliver us all on this planet. That's what I'm asking you to do. So be fruitful and multiply. <laughs> you know, Kirk and Chelsea, our son and his wife, I've been itching to be able to announce this and have been told to sit on it, but they're going to have a third child. Hallelujah. Now hold the applause, please. Thanks. <laughs> they're going to have a third child. They already have two beautiful little girls. Ella is seven. Isabel is three. We call her Izzy. And now they're going to have three beautiful little girls. And the third one, Missy or Sissy or whatever, will be born in September. And so just in case they're watching online right now in Kettering, Ohio, I need to say to them the words of God, be fruitful and multiply. That's the only way you can create grandchildren. <laughs> so, so God unites Adam and Eve in marriage. We all know the story. And some believe this one sentence is the first wedding homily ever preached on this planet, preached by the Creator Himself. Let's take a look at it. Just turn one page to Genesis 2, the last, next to the last line of Genesis 2. That is why the Creator says to Adam and Eve, that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Our Creator has just defined marriage for us. It is not simply copulation. Those are the activities of animals. But it's more. What's the definition? Let's, put, let's just put it on the screen for us. Definition of marriage. Marriage is the mystical union of two human beings, one male, the other female, who are declared by God to be one flesh for the rest of their lives. That's pretty simple, isn't it? You can't get more basic than that. Which is why when the Creator incarnates Himself and becomes five fingers on each hand and one of us on this planet, the page and script is not changed a single word. Watch Him when He goes back to that story. So this is over now in uh, Matthew chapter 19. So move from Genesis 1 to Matthew chapter 19. Drop down to verse 4. He's going to quote what we just read from the in the beginning chapter of the Bible. Matthew 19, verse 4. Haven't you read, Jesus replied, these are red letter words, that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female. That's straight from Genesis 1.27. He goes on and said, for this reason, still quoting, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. Now Jesus, the Creator incarnate, is going to add one more line. And here's the line. So they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Hmm. The Supreme Court decision in Obergefell did not take apart what God has joined together. You know why? Because there is no human court that can rewrite the definition of marriage that God has established. Impossible. It is the one definition the human race has been living with for millennia now. Uncontested reality. What the Supreme Court ruled is that same gender unions must receive the same protection under United States law that opposite gender unions have heretofore enjoyed. And you know what? I agree. I do. Why? It wouldn't be fair for this nation to deny same gender couples the protection of the law, the coverage of health insurance, the security of wills and testaments upon death, and every other right and privilege extended to citizens of opposite sex marriages. That's why. The Supreme Court ruling ensures that such protections and privileges are accorded to all of this nation's citizens. But I repeat, that ruling did not disassemble the divine biblical definition and institution of marriage that Jesus has just affirmed to us in red letters. You can't touch it. 
You can't, you can't break the law of marriage, just like you can't break the law of gravity. It can break you, but you can't break it. What God has put together, let no one take apart. <laughs> that's clear. That's uncontested. What God has put together, no one can take apart. And thus, the Bible idea for, ideal for human marriage is still intended to be the reality of life on this planet with the following post-fall exceptions, all right? I'm going to run some exceptions by you. Post-fall exceptions. Number one, exception number one, singlehood. Jesus' red letter words are not a divine command for all human beings to marry. How could they be? Jesus was unmarried his entire life. He was single when he spoke these words. Paul himself, the great champion of Christianity, actually suggested that singlehood celibacy is a higher gift than human marriage. So only those who have the gift need apply. John the Baptist was single. And as far as we know, so was John the Beloved. Elijah was single. And so was Elisha. And so was Jeremiah. And so was Anna. And so is the long list of who's who in Holy Scripture. Single human beings. There is, now please understand this, there is no biblical stigma attached to a man or a woman who chooses to remain single. And we ought not to judge them. Oh, I've heard. You know, you know, why, he's, you know why he's been single all his life? I'll tell you why. That is absolutely ludicrous. Who gave you the right to judge? Stop it. Singlehood is an exception. The creator himself said, I'll be single. An honored singlehood. Celibacy is a gift that the Bible recognizes not all possess, but, now listen, 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 sexual abstinence is what the Bible requires of all Christians outside of marriage, whether straight or gay. Sexual abstinence. If you fiddle around with sex outside of marriage, you are playing with dynamite and it will kill you spiritually. It will kill you spiritually. The creator knows what he's talking about. And part of loving him is trusting him and believing that he knows. All right, so here are some post-fall exceptions to marriage. Number one, there is the exception of singlehood. And number two, there is the exception of remarriage. Remarriage upon the death of a spouse. The great father Abraham, his heart broken after he buries Sarah, his life companion, eventually remarries. He's lonely. It's okay to remarry, as far as we know. Joseph, who marries the young virgin Mary, who gives birth to the Son of God, Son of Man, Joseph himself already had a family. His wife deceased, and he remarries this young teenage girl. That's okay. We know that they're older than Jesus because of the way his stepbrothers treat him. They treat Jesus like an older brother, just a pain sometimes. All right, so remarriage. One of the post-fall exceptions to marriage is remarriage. Remarriage upon the death of a spouse and remarriage upon the death of a marriage through adultery. It is a sad and tragic story, but it happens on this fallen and unideal planet. But there is a third exception to marriage between a man and a woman, an exception created by culture and not by the Creator. And the question is, is this third exception valid with God? That's what a gay young Christian man named Justin Lee is wrestling with. He's written a book. I've read the book. The title of the book is Torn. It's an engaging first-person testimony. Uh, Justin Lee grew up in a Christian family. He had a loving mother. He had a loving father. He had a loving brother. But somehow, something inside of him began to experience same-gender attraction. He tried to deny it. He tried to just say it's not, not there. He tried to pray it out of himself. In fact, he even begged God to kill me. I can't live with this. As other gays 
and lesbians who are believers have prayed. You don't understand the angst. You do not understand the angst. Anyway, he spends a whole chapter in his book, title of the chapter, Why Are People Gay? And it's a lot of research, and it's very uh, well expressed. But he ends, the, he ends that chapter with this concluding uh, paragraph, Justin Lee writing, Why are some people attracted to the same sex? The truth is we don't know for sure. The biological theories have the most evidence to support them right now. But even they have lots of questions, and at this point, we can't prove anything. We can only make educated guesses. And guess what? The Seventh-day Adventist Church comes along, and after the Obergefell ruling in the summer of 2015, that fall, the North American Division of Seventh-day Adventists issues its own statement on marriage, and we'll, we'll note a line that is agreeing with Justin Lee right now. In view of the fact that scientists and other experts have not reached a consensus concerning the factors leading to sexual orientation, usually understood to involve the complex roles of nature and nurture, the Adventist church does not presume to have settled the scientific and social questions regarding the cause of non-heterosexual orientation, end quote. But as Justin Lee continues his story, he tells of meeting ex-gays at conferences who were publicly claiming to be healed. Now, his response is, is, is nuanced, and I think it's rather bright. Let's, let's put Justin Lee back on the screen here. The testimonies of these gays up front, or ex-gays, the testimonies were powerful reminders of how God changes lives. It was largely faith in God that enabled them to overcome a history of sexual addiction and substance abuse. Now, keep, keep reading. But there was one thing missing in all their testimonies. None of them seemed to be becoming straight. They had changed their behaviors, sometimes in dramatic ways. Some had not had any sexual contact in years. Others had gone so far as to date and marry a member of the opposite sex, but almost universally when I asked. So he gets alone with these upfront speakers who come to share their testimony. When he gets alone with them, when I asked, they confessed that they still had the same kind of same-sex attractions that I did. Hmm. Now, does that negate these, these public speakers being truly redeemed, truly rescued, truly, truly renewed in their experience with Jesus? Not at all. Of course, that's a valid, powerful testimony. But what Justin Lee is describing is that even when you do not engage in same-gender sex and are celibate as he is, the same-gender attraction does not necessarily go away. For some people, ever go away. And they are still Christian. They are still believers and disciples of Jesus. Rebecca McLaughlin, in her book, Confronting Christianity, 12 Hard Questions for the World's Largest Religion. It was a Golden Medallion Award in the Evangelical Press a couple years ago. I've read the book. Describes her own struggles with same gender attraction. So we'll, we'll put her on the screen. Part, oh, no, 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 no. Before we get to her, this is really important. So, so Justin Lee is saying, yo, 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 yo. So how do you explain this? Have these guys been healed or not? Are they telling the truth or not? Now watch how he handles this. Part of the problem was that neither these leaders nor their audiences were careful to distinguish between sexual behaviors and sexual attractions. When people like me said we were gay, it was because of our attractions. I'm still attracted. I'm not practicing, but I'm still attracted. When the ex-gay leaders stand up front and say they aren't gay, it's because of their behaviors. I'm no longer living that way is what they're saying. Hmm. Interesting. They're just using the word in a different way. Now let's go to Re Rebecca McLaughlin. Mine is a story of a girl who found herself from childhood falling in love with older, inaccessible girls, but hoped and prayed she would grow out of it. 
a dream that finally died in grad school. By the way, no small grad school, Cambridge University, where she got her PhD in Renaissance literature, okay? But this dream died in grad school. It's a story of silence and quiet loss as my heart got stuck to people who could not want me back. It's a story of never touching another woman in a sexual way, but always longing for more intimacy, sometimes more than I knew I could have. You can just feel that. And then she pivots to a stunning line that I hope you'll take away with you today. One line. Here it is. Blue blood heterosexuality is not the goal of the Christian life. Jesus is. Take a look at that. Blue blood heterosexuality is not the goal of the Christian life. Jesus is. You see the difference? It's a huge difference. And who is this Jesus? He's the maker of all things who loves and wants me and who loves and wants you. And what does Jesus want us to do? Listen, it is neither the goal of Christ Jesus nor the mission of the church of Christ to seek to turn every LGBTQ plus member into a heterosexual Christian. Heterosexuality is not the end game. It is not the end goal. In fact, in all honesty, marriage is transient at best right now. You don't believe it? Turn three pages further in Matthew. Go to Matthew chapter 22. Watch this. Red letter words now. At the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. Hmm. Angels? Angels, apparently, who are aromantic or asexual, or maybe we should call them suprasexual, we will be like them. So I'm asking you a question. Why would the church then consider it her mission to turn all people into heterosexuals with opposite sex attraction? We're not even headed that way. I want to say a word to the parents who are listening right now. And I know you're listening. My dear parents, if you have a child who is a part of the LGBTQ community, your mission is not to pray that child into heterosexuality. Your mission, please, your mission is to love that child until your dying day or until Jesus returns. Only you know the depth of the pain. The members of the LGBT community know the depth of the pain in coming out. But nobody can know the pain of a parent in receiving the coming out. And it, and it is a deep pain. Both of you are in pain together. There are times when LGBTQ members say, I reject you as my parent. There are times when gay or lesbian children say, I thoroughly disagree with your position, and because of that, I'm not coming home again. None of us understands. Only those who endure together. But in this time of immense hurt and confusion and confusion and sadness, it is also a painful but profound opportunity, mom and dad, and LGBT person, to demonstrate unrelenting love to the other in the midst of this crisis. You, you have nothing to gain to cut your love off from each other, either side. Love. Put your arms around each other. Weep. It represents a broken dream, not just for parents, but for the child. Some dreams have to be buried. They cannot be returned to, parent or child. It's not a question of blame. It's not a question of cause. 
It's simply an opportunity for you both to now live out the radical love of Jesus. Parents to your children and children to your parents. And oh my, may I say this, it is not the time for the church of Christ to rise up in anger or disgust or righteous indignation and expel that errant member. You're out of here. Why would you do that now? I listened to a testimony this week from a graduate of our theological seminary here on campus who has lived with same gender, same gender attraction since his early teen years, but has remained celibate nonetheless. It was a moving testimony. It's beautiful how he described his mother stunned on that day when she learns this for the first time and takes a day or two just to recover from what he's told her. And he broke down and just sobbed uncontrollably. But how that mother, two days later, becomes a staunch supporter of her gay child. And he loves her to death, and she loves him to death. But it was sad when he had to tell, tell about their home congregation, how it rose up in opposition to the very, very fact that one of their own would continue to call himself gay. You're supposed to get over being gay, and in no uncertain terms, pushed away that young man and his family from that congregation. He still loves Jesus. He still works for the church. No, we at Pioneer Memorial Church on the campus of Andrews University cannot become a congregation like that. No, no. It is possible some congregations glory in their purity, but we will glory in the Christ who has called us to be love on the move. That was a powerful children's story, wasn't it, that animation? That's our, that's our mission statement. Th those are our watchwords, love on the move. Straight, gay, lesbian, transgender, sinner saved by the grace and the love of the maker of all things who loves and wants us. That is, that is who we are. We are a menagerie of broken people at the Pioneer Memorial Church. We are broken. But we gather together every Sabbath in hopes that somehow in the, in the deepest of our pain, where the breakage is so severe that a word from the Lord Jesus might yet speak hope to us. A menagerie of broken people. Reminds me of what Martin Luther once wrote. And by the way, it appears in, of all places, the great controversy. Hmm? So this is Martin Luther writing, May God of his mercy preserve me from a church in which there are none but saints. I desire to dwell with the humble, the feeble, the sick who know and feel their sins and who groan and cry continually to God from the bottom of their hearts to obtain his consolation and support. That is a powerful depiction, by the way, of the LGBTQ plus community who are believers crying out. Martin Luther, me too. We too. We too. The truth is we are all broken. I hope you didn't miss, miss last Sabbath. Man, my friends, David and Beverly Sedlicek, I sat right over there, listened intently, and they made this point and reiterated it, and I could not shake it. We are all broken, they said. Sunday morning when I go to my prayer journal, I just take that one line, we are all broken, and I start responding to that in a way that's dealing with my own brokenness. We are all broken. That's the truth. You may look fine to me today, but there is inside of you a jagged and broken piece you cannot deny. We are all broken. I may look fine to you today, but there is inside of me a broken and jagged piece which I cannot deny. We are all broken. Straight, lesbian, gay, transgender, queer, heterosexual, it doesn't matter who we are, we are all broken. And that line stays with me. Blue blood heterosexuality is not the goal of the Christian life. Jesus is. Yes. Yes. And so I say humbly, I invite you humbly to join me in resolving today that we will become a part of Jesus' Church of the Broken right now.
right now. Oh, God. We are all broken. Let him who is without sin, let him who is unbroken throw the first stone. There's not a soul that can move and pick up that stone. You took it instead. It's not blue blood heterosexuality that we seek. It's the red-blooded redemption of our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary, the healing, the depth of a healing that we all can experience together. So, dear God, do whatever you wish, but keep this little congregation on the campus of this great university a place where Jesus' love is on the move. We pray in his name. Amen. Connect card today. pmchurch.org slash connect. Here you go. I wish to be part of Jesus' Church of the Broken. Yeah, me too. Yeah, I'll put a check mark there with you. I believe Jesus has the power to enable me to live true to him in his purity, same gender or opposite gender attraction notwithstanding. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus. You put a check mark there. I believe. I believe Jesus has the power to enable me to live true to him and his purity, same gender or opposite gender attraction notwithstanding. And then I'm going to put here, please pray for me. You don't have to put any details. But if you put your name and an email address, I'll personally pray for you. All right? It'd be an honor to. Finally, I wish to follow Jesus and be baptized. That's how you can write a new chapter. You can't change everything inside, but you can give your heart to him. And you and Jesus can write the best chapter that has ever been written in your life when you walk with him. If you've not been baptized, straight, gay, it doesn't matter, lesbian, if you have not been baptized and you want to walk with this Jesus, put a check mark there, put an email address, we'll be in touch with you electronically. Explore what that means. Before you go, let me take an extra moment to share with you an opportunity to get into the Bible in a fresh new way. All across the world, more and more people are hearing the call to examine scriptures for themselves. If you felt drawn to learn more about God's Word, but you don't know where to start, or you're just looking for a more in-depth examination of Bible truths, then I have something right here that I believe you're going to enjoy. I want to send a series of guides to get you started. This one's entitled, Why Does God Allow Suffering? Each guide begins with a story, and an introduction of the subject, then through a series of focus questions. You'll be learning portions of the Bible you may never have known before. And when you're through, you'll be able to share with others some of these inspiring Bible truths. So just call our toll-free number. It's on the screen, 877, the two words, His Will. Our friendly operators are standing by to send these study guides to you. Once again, that's 877, His Will. Call that number. And then again, join me next week right here at the same time. New Perceptions.